Good day, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. How do you get back? Iraq was destroyed in the water. Is this the wrath of God? Is this a sign from God? In this episode, I will explain in more detail. Smash that thumbs up button for me, leave me a comment down below, and share this video with your friends. Let's get started. A storm has hit the Iraq region, causing serious consequences and threatening the safety of local residents. This storm is described as having dense dark clouds, bringing strong winds and heavy rain, reducing visibility and causing the risk of traffic accidents on the roads. Strong winds damaged many residential structures and caused power outages from the power grid, making people's daily lives difficult. Local authorities and aid organizations had to mobilize immediately to ensure the safety of residents, relocate those in high-risk areas, and provide necessary services such as clean water and food. In addition, the storm also poses a great risk of flooding and landslides, especially in areas with steep terrain. Faced with this emergency situation, people need to strengthen prevention measures such as controlling water flow and moving to safe areas. Meanwhile, international organizations and friendly countries have stepped in to provide urgent relief assistance, such as providing clean water, medical care, and construction materials to rebuild after the storm. However, this still faces security challenges and restrictions on access to affected areas. The heavy rain from the storm caused rivers and reservoirs to overflow, exceeding their carrying capacity and flooding into residential areas. Villages and cities were heavily flooded, causing thousands of people to urgently evacuate and lose their homes and properties. The powerful floods have also caused landslides, collapsing many infrastructure works, including railways and bridges, cutting off traffic and hindering rescue efforts. Local and national authorities and international organizations had to mobilize all possible resources to rescue and support people severely affected by the floods, providing clean water, food, and temporary shelter, along with emergency medical services, are top priorities in relief operations. The aftermath of the storm combined with flooding in Iraq was a scene of devastation, with severe loss of life and property. Thousands of families have lost their homes, businesses have been destroyed or lost power, clean water, and basic services. The number of deaths and injuries is rising rapidly, especially in isolated and hard-to-reach areas. After the storm and flood in Iraq passed, there was another strange phenomenon which scared everyone. Iraq is famous for being a hot place because it surrounds the desert. This is not unusual since there are bugs here. One bug, two bugs, don't say. But from where a flock of bugs appeared, they crawl everywhere. People were scared and ran everywhere, the sudden appearance of these bugs in such overwhelming numbers sent shivers down the spines of the already shaken populace. Streets and alleyways became overrun with the skittering horde, crawling over every available surface and invading homes and shelters alike. Panic spread like wildfire as people scrambled to evade the advancing tide of bugs, their buzzing wings and chittering calls filling the air with an eerie cacophony. The phenomenon left scientists baffled and locals deeply unsettled as theories and rumors swirled about the cause of this sudden bug infestation. Some whispered of supernatural forces at play, while others pointed to environmental factors exacerbated by the recent calamity. Regardless of the explanation, one thing was clear, Iraq's ordeal was far from over as it now faced a new and insidious threat crawling at its very doorstep. Coincidentally, these bugs also appeared in Egypt. Bugs in Egypt are glossy black, about 3 to 4 centimeters big. They sometimes make noises and they especially like the smell of human flesh. It's so scary. They often crawl in herds, each herd has hundreds of animals. The eerie similarity between the bug invasion in Iraq and Egypt only deepened the sense of unease and foreboding. Reports trickled in from across the border detailing the same swarms of glossy black bugs, their menacing presence casting a shadow over the already troubled region. In Egypt, where the bugs are notorious for their size and aggressiveness, the arrival of such vast numbers only compounded the fear and anxiety among the populace. 
These bugs, with their shiny black exoskeletons and ominous noises, were not merely a nuisance but a genuine threat to human safety. Their preference for the scent of human flesh added an additional layer of horror, sending chills down the spines of those forced to confront their relentless advance. As in Iraq, the bugs in Egypt moved in massive herds, numbering in the hundreds and blanketing the landscape in a living carpet of creeping legs and clicking mandibles. No corner was safe from their relentless march, and the sight of these swarming bugs filled even the bravest souls with a sense of dread and helplessness. In both countries, efforts to combat the bug invasion were met with limited success, as the bugs seemed impervious to traditional methods of pest control. With each passing day, the situation grew more dire as the bugs continued to spread unchecked, leaving devastation in their wake, the simultaneous appearance of these bugs in two countries only served to deepen the mystery surrounding their sudden emergence. Some speculated that they were the result of a freak environmental event, while others whispered of darker forces at play. Whatever the explanation, one thing was certain, the bugs had brought with them a plague of fear and uncertainty that threatened to engulf the entire region in its grip. As fear and uncertainty gripped both Iraq and Egypt, authorities scrambled to find a solution to the burgeoning bug infestation. In Iraq, teams of scientists and pest control experts worked tirelessly to develop strategies to contain and eradicate the swarms, deploying everything from insecticide sprays to biological control measures in a desperate bid to stem the tide. Meanwhile, in Egypt, where the bugs were known to be particularly resilient, efforts to combat the invasion took on a more urgent tone. Communities banded together to implement makeshift barriers and traps, hoping to divert the advancing hordes away from populated areas. Yet despite their best efforts, the bugs seemed to have an uncanny ability to adapt and overcome any obstacle in their path. As the days stretched into weeks and the bug invasion showed no signs of abating, the toll on both countries became increasingly apparent. Agriculture suffered as crops were devoured by the ravenous bugs, exacerbating food shortages and economic hardship. Public health concerns mounted as the bugs spread diseases and infections, adding another layer of complexity to an already dire situation. Amidst the chaos and despair, stories of resilience and solidarity emerged as communities came together to support one another in the face of adversity. Neighbors helped neighbors fortify their homes against the encroaching bugs, while volunteers distributed much-needed supplies and assistance to those hardest hit by the infestation. Yet despite these acts of bravery and compassion, the shadow of uncertainty loomed large over both countries, with no end in sight to the bug invasion and no clear answers as to its origins or motivations. The people of Iraq and Egypt could only brace themselves for what lay ahead, hoping against hope that relief would soon be on the horizon. If you remember, this is also mentioned in the Bible. This is the third plague in the Bible. So the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your rod and strike the dust of the land, so that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so, for Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod and struck the dust of the earth, and it became lice on man and beast. All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. As Aaron struck the dust with his staff, a stream of bugs believed to be either lice or gnats swarmed across Egypt. The people of Egypt were tormented with these bugs, completely unable to escape them no matter where they went. Still, the Pharaoh refused to let the Israelites go. The eerie parallels between the biblical account of the plagues in Egypt and the modern-day bug invasion in Iraq and Egypt did not escape the notice of religious scholars and historians. Many saw it as a chilling reminder of the power of divine intervention and the consequences of defying the will of a higher power. Just as the Pharaoh stubbornly resisted the demands of Moses and Aaron, so too did the leaders of Iraq and Egypt find themselves grappling with a force beyond their control. The bugs, like the lice of biblical lore, seem to serve as a powerful symbol of divine retribution, a reminder that even the mightiest rulers are not immune to the consequences of their actions. Amidst the chaos and suffering, there were those who found solace in faith, turning to prayer and reflection in the hopes of finding meaning in the midst of the turmoil. Whether viewed as a punishment or a test of faith, 
the bug invasion served as a sobering reminder of the fragility of human existence and the need for humility in the face of forces beyond our understanding. As the bug invasion persisted, some religious leaders and scholars drew further parallels between the biblical plagues and the contemporary events unfolding in Iraq and Egypt. They pointed to the biblical narrative as a cautionary tale, warning against the dangers of hubris and the consequences of ignoring warnings from a higher power. In both ancient times and modern day, the refusal to heed divine warnings led to widespread suffering and devastation. The bugs, like the plagues of Egypt, served as a wake-up call, a reminder of the consequences of arrogance and injustice. They forced people to confront their own mortality and vulnerability, prompting introspection and a re-evaluation of priorities. Yet amidst the chaos and despair, there were also signs of hope and resilience. Communities rallied together, drawing strength from their faith and supporting one another in the face of adversity. Prayers were offered up for deliverance, and acts of kindness and compassion abounded as people sought to alleviate the suffering of their neighbors. In the end, the bug invasion served as a powerful reminder of the interconnectedness of all life and the need for humility and reverence in the face of nature's power. It prompted reflection on humanity's role as stewards of the earth and the importance of living in harmony with the natural world. As the bugs eventually receded and life slowly returned to normal, the lessons learned from the ordeal would not soon be forgotten. They would serve as a reminder that in the face of adversity, it is faith, compassion, and resilience that ultimately see us through. And perhaps they would inspire a renewed commitment to building a world where justice, compassion, and harmony reign supreme. There are two separate judgments. Believers are judged at the judgment seat of Christ. Every believer will give an account of himself, and the Lord will judge the decisions he made, including those concerning issues of conscience. This judgment does not determine salvation, which is by faith alone, but rather is the time when believers must give an account of their lives in service to Christ. Our position in Christ is the foundation spoken of in 1 Corinthians 3 verses 11 to 15. That which we build upon the foundation can be the gold, silver, and precious stones of good works in Christ's name, obedience and fruitfulness, dedicated spiritual service to glorify God and build the church. Or what we build on the foundation may be the wood, hay, and stubble of worthless, frivolous, shallow activity with no spiritual value. The judgment seat of Christ will reveal this, the gold, silver, and precious stones in the lives of believers will survive God's refining fire, and believers will be rewarded based on those good works. How faithfully we served Christ, how well we obeyed the Great Commission, how victorious we were over sin, Romans 6 verse 14, how well we controlled our tongues, etc. We will have to give an account for our actions, whether they were truly indicative of our position in Christ. The fire of God's judgment will completely burn up the wood, hay, and stubble of the words we spoke and things we did which had no eternal value. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. The second judgment is that of unbelievers who will be judged at the great white throne judgment. This judgment does not determine salvation either. Everyone at the great white throne is an unbeliever who has rejected Christ in life and is therefore already doomed to the lake of fire. Revelation 20 verse 12 says that unbelievers will be judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. Those who have rejected Christ as Lord and Savior will be judged based on their works alone, and because the Bible tells us that by the works of the law no flesh will be justified, Galatians 2 verse 16, they will be condemned. No amount of good works and the keeping of God's laws can be sufficient to atone for sin. All their thoughts, words, and actions will be judged against God's perfect standard and found wanting. There will be no reward for them, only eternal condemnation and punishment. Only God is capable of being totally objective, since He knows all contingencies, all possibilities, all hypotheticals, all evidence, and all rationales. Man cannot excuse himself in God's presence, he anticipates all man's shame and ignorance. God's judgment is permanent and final, and there are consequences to be determined. God also tempers his judgments with mercy, cf Habakkuk 3 verse 2, 
and always grants man more than he deserves in mercy. But his justice is not beyond that which strict justice demands. The evil will get their final comeuppance and just deserts, but God is unjust to no one and doesn't owe anyone mercy or it would be justice to save man. But mankind is fallen from grace and deserves eternal damnation as a result. God meets out his justice in due time and measure, and though he is just, sometimes it carries. God is just, and his justice doesn't sleep. But there is no appeal to God's perfect verdict. In contrast, man is biased and limited in knowledge and incapable of rendering a just verdict with perfection and without error. Man's justice can be appealed to a higher authority and can even be overruled. A man can sin against another, and a court can adjudicate, but when a man sins against God, only God can render justice. In God's perfect court, there can be no appeal to any higher authority, his judgment is eternal. What is Judgment Day? The Bible declares that God has set a day in which he purposes to judge the inhabited earth. This day of judgment, also known as the final judgment, is when Jesus, the Son of God, will judge the living and the dead before destroying the old heaven and earth, which are corrupted by sin. Sin can be defined as anything that opposes God's will and law, to engage in sin is to disobey or abuse his laws. Because the urge to sin resides in human nature, mankind is corrupted and somewhat driven by the immoral inclinations that live in all people. This is a consequence of the fall into sin in the Garden of Eden. Before creating his new heaven and earth, God must do away with anything that could produce or bear sin into his new creation. Jesus Christ will act as the justice of the last judgment, as the Bible states, moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. All skeptics will be judged by Christ at the great white throne, and they will face punishment in accordance with the acts they have done. The Bible is very definite that skeptics are collecting up vengeance against themselves, and that God will give to each person according to what he has done. At the final judgment, the destiny of the wicked and non-believers will be in the control of the Almighty God, who will assess everyone according to their soul's status. Let's look at the notable biblical references about judgment to get a better understanding of God's last judgment. Bible verses about judgment day, therefore judge nothing before the appointed time, wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their praise from God. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. But I tell you that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words, you will be condemned. I solemnly charge you before God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his manifestation and his kingdom. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it. From his face, the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. How will we be judged on Judgment Day? According to Charles Stanley, Scripture declares that Jesus Christ will judge every person who has ever lived. Those who reject his offer of salvation face the white throne judgment, the unbelievers last stop before an eternity of exile from God's presence. Believers will also stand before Jesus, at which time they'll finally come to a full comprehension of his extravagant grace. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, Paul says that Jesus will disclose the motives hidden in believers' hearts. Some people have gotten the misguided idea that all their sins will be displayed for everyone to see, but the Bible in no way supports that notion. Jesus will expose the true nature of a believer's heart to him or her. Every rebellious act, wrong attitude, and cutting word will be reviewed. When the Bible says that Jesus will wipe the tears from our eyes, it is referring to this time. We'll be standing in the Holy Savior's presence, grieving over how undeserving we are of his sacrifice. But the sorrow will last only a moment, 
on its heels comes the tremendous joy of having received forgiveness and lived a life pleasing to Him. Christ's judgment is not a punishment, it is a reminder that we are pardoned. At last, we will fully realize the depth and breadth of His grace. Believers need not cower or hang their heads during the judgment, nor are we to repent, the time for that is past. We will stand before the Lord clothed in Christ's righteousness and forgiven.